talking about the state of regulation in Europe, not the U.S. this time, but in Europe. This is a very relevant episode, David, because you and I have talked a lot about regulation in the United States. It's not a, a topic that I like to think about very often, um, but we, we do talk about it from time to time in, uh, in Bankless Podcast, and especially recently. We have hardly ever talked about what's going on in Europe, just kind of passing comments. I allocate about 10% of my brain to regulation because it's just like, it's not fun to think about, but sometimes you gotta. Uh, this week is one of those weeks. Um, and most of that time is reserved for the regulatory state of the United States. Right. So we wanted an update on what is going on in Europe. And it actually sounds like, David, the lawmakers in the EU are doing their jobs, actually looking at crypto somewhat objectively, I think, and proposing legislative frameworks to help us move forward. That is something that we don't have the luxury of mm -hmm. in the United States. And I want to find out more about that on today's episode. But why don't you give us a tease? Mm -hmm. Who do we have on and what are we in for today? Yeah, across the pond, there's this thing called MICA, uh, Markets in Crypto Assets, which is the regulatory proposal, a landmark regulatory proposal that is working its way through Europe. Uh, and so we're going to talk about that because there is actual progress being made for better or for worse. There is at least a conversation happening. Um, there are some wins. There are some some losses. And so we're going to talk about the nuances of the MICA proposal in the EU. Uh, but <laughs> it's in stark contrast Ryan, to what's happening here uh, in the United States, where there doesn't really seem to be a conversation. There just seems to be an onslaught. So at least we have that jealousy to look forward to uh, from our American standpoint. We have three panelists on because because this is a big conversation. We have Rebecca Reddig, who is the Chief Policy Officer over at Polygon Lab. Started there as of a week ago, so congrats, Rebecca, from the new position. Uh, there's also Seth, who is the v VP of Global Head of Policy at Ledger. Ledger, the hardware uh, wallet company, of course, that everyone knows. If you did not know that it is a France-based company, now you know. Uh, and also Patrick Hansen, uh, Director of EU Strategy and Policy at Circle. Uh, and so these people combined probably know as much as there is to know about the state of crypto digital asset regulation in the European Union. And so we are going to get up to speed with what is going on across the pond as it relates to digital asset regulation. And what can we really learn from the actual progress that's actually happening at least somewhere in the world, if not the United States? And I, you know, I could comment further, but I don't think we should, David. I think maybe uh, us dumb Americans should just um, stop commenting and bring on our guests. And we're about to do that. But before we do, we want to thank the sponsors that made this episode possible, including Kraken, our recommended exchange for 2023. Kraken has been a leader in the crypto industry for the last 12 years. Dedicated to accelerating the global adoption of crypto, Kraken puts an emphasis on security, transparency, and client support, which is why over 9 million clients have come to love Kraken's products. Whether you're a beginner or a pro, the Kraken UX is simple, intuitive, and frictionless, making the Kraken app a great place for all to get involved and learn about crypto. For those with experience, the redesigned Kraken Pro app and web experience is completely customizable to your trading needs. Integrating key trading features into one seamless interface. Kraken has a 24-7, 365 client support team that is globally recognized. Kraken support is available wherever, whenever you need them, by phone, chat, or email. And for all of you NFTers out there, the brand new Kraken NFT beta platform gives you the best NFT trading experience possible. Rarity rankings, no gas fees, and the ability to buy an NFT straight with cash. Does your crypto exchange prioritize its customers the way that Kraken does? And if not, sign up with Kraken at Kraken. Com slash bankless. How many total airdrops have you gotten? This last bull market had a ton of them. Did you get them all? Maybe you missed one. So here's what you should do. Go to Earnify and plug in your Ethereum wallet and Earnify will tell you if you have any unclaimed airdrops that you can get. And it also does PO apps and mintable NFTs. Any kind of money that your wallet can claim, Earnify will tell you about it. And you should probably do it now because some airdrops expire. And if you sign up for Earnify, they'll email you anytime one of your wallets has a new airdrop for it to make sure that you never lose an airdrop ever again. You can also upgrade to Earnify Premium to unlock access to airdrops that are beyond the basics and are able to set reminders for more wallets. And for just under $21 a month, it probably pays for itself with just one airdrop. So plug in your wallets at Earnify and see what you get. That's E-A-R-N-I dot F-I. And make sure you never lose another airdrop. Welcome, Bankless Nation, to this panel about the state of crypto asset regulation over in the EU, talking all about this MICA proposal 
On the right most side of the screen, we got Seth, who is the VP Global Head of Policy at Ledger. Below Seth, in the bottom right corner of your screen, we got Rebecca Reddick, who is the Chief Policy Officer at Polygon Labs. Rebecca, congrats on the new position. Uh, and then in the bottom left corner, we got Patrick Hansen, who is the Director of EU Policy and Strategy at Circle. Seth, Rebecca, and Patrick, welcome to the show. Thank you guys so much for, for being here. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much for having us and for touching that topic of EU regulation. Yeah, and so just to, to really kick things off here, uh, Ryan and I are going to be dunces when it comes to this. So we're really looking to you guys to really help us understand what's going on here. Uh, and so, uh, Rebecca, just picking one of the three, I'll, I'll start with you. Uh, the state of crypto regulation in the United States is kind of a mess. Uh, how's it going across the pond? It's going much differently in the EU. Um, I think we have to take it back to where Mika really started. Um, this really grew out of the introduction of DM slash Libra back in 2017. And I think real work started to be done on Mika in about 2018. And, um, and you guys say Mika, not Micah. Excuse me. I don't know. Maybe Patty will correct me, but what I is the right pronunciation? <laughs> Give it to us. I've always, I've always said Mika. Mika. All right, I, perfect. I also say Mika because it's markets in, in crypto assets. So it's ah, consensus. We're Mika. already making progress. It's great. Yeah. All right. All right. <laughs> Sorry for interrupting. Oh no, no, that's okay. Uh, so it started back and and I think it, the con the concept really grew out of Libra and thinking about how to regulate that type of stablecoin. I think there was a similar type of. Um, interest and concerns in the United States as well, but it really spurred um, the European Union to think about what types of regulation should come out. Um, obviously, it was just approved um, by the parliament, and we should talk about the process of what happens in the EU. This is very different uh, than what happens in the US, although I guess you can think of the member countries as the states and um, the commission to be a much uh, broader umbrella like we have in, in the federal system in the United States. Uh, but anyway, um, they built out this system where it really covers what are called CASPs, um, crypto asset service providers. These are centralized or CFI players. So things like custody, trading, exchanges, uh, market makers and OTCs, investment advisors, they're covered um, by it, as well as how you can do an issuance of tokens publicly. Uh, and then there are some exemptions for private token issuances as well. And it's really, a, it attempts to be a very um, comprehensive piece of regulation, but Seth and Patty should also sort of weigh in and talk about you know what we're building out here as well. Yeah, Seth, yeah, Patrick, any, any additional things to add? Yeah, sure. So, so, you know, I think that's an important context that, that Rebecca uh, brings up that, you know, that Mika really was the, the European response to Libra. And, and it actually goes a little bit deeper than that, um, which, uh, uh, you know, I think uh, Patty can probably speak to. But there's there's this sense in, in Europe, uh, particularly among policymakers, that that Europe sort of lost Web2. Um, you know, that, uh, you know that, that all of sort of the Web2 giants are, you know, well, first American and then increasingly Chinese. Um, you know, the only one you, maybe you could point to in, in Europe is Spotify. Um, and, you know, so there's this there's a sort of sense that, that Europe lost Web 2. And then when, you know, Facebook, sort of the, the big evil you know, Web 2 giant from the U.S. announces, uh, you know, Libra, it really scared, uh, it really scared European policymakers that like, oh, no, we're going to lose the next thing. And, you know, so so Mika, you know, you know, there was a strong reaction to Libra in the U.S. Um, you know, I, I, I was in Congress uh, uh, the day, uh, actually the, the building, uh, when uh, when Zuck testified uh, for the first time on, on Libra. And, you know, so there was a strong response in the U.S., but I think it was it was much more uh, palpable in, in, in Europe, uh, sort of the threat that it posed. And so, uh, you know, policymakers immediately got to work on uh, on Mika. Uh, as a response to Libra, and that's why it overwhelmingly focuses on stablecoins to this day. Um, but it sort of grew, it Frankensteined a little bit into other areas, um, you know, almost right up until the end. Um, and and we can get into that a little bit later, um, you know. But that's it's you know that's sort of the origin of of, of Mika, uh, and uh, I think a lot of but, why it's sort of structured the way it is. So Seth, really quick, just to double click on that point before we hear from Patrick on that. So you're saying part of the impetus for this uh, Mika legislation is actually the US wanting to not miss the next wave of the internet. The so EU, this, not the US. The EU. The EU, yeah. yes, the, I said the US. Not wanting to miss the next wave of the internet. And so this was like, a, was this like sort of a, 
Well, in, in Europe, our competitive advantage will be clarity and regulation. And that's how we will win crypto innovation in the next phase of the internet in, in our jurisdiction. Was that the approach? And is that the strategy? And is that sort of coming through? Yeah, I mean, there, there's there's a bit of a joke, um, you know, that that you know Europe's uh, or the EU's chief export is regulation, um, you know. So I think, <laughs> uh, and and you know, there there have been some speak, uh, speeches from you know from from high ranking EU officials uh, or from the from the European Commission in particular uh, about about leading on regulation. So that's that's absolutely a philosophy that um, you know is is at play here. Um, and, and I actually don't think in the specific case of, of sort of Mika, Libra, I, I don't think it's so much about, um, you know, sort of not losing the next phase of the internet. I think it was more a specific fear of Facebook um, and um, sort of the continuing the Web 2 loss. I don't think it had quite, I don't think the opportunity of Web 3 had, had sort of quite, um, you know, gotten into the, the political discourse yet. Um, but but I'd, I'd love to, to hear Patty's thoughts on sort of how, how it developed. Yeah, happy to. I, I think to begin with, it's, it's important to note that Mika is really a comprehensive regulatory package for crypto. So I think that's the main difference, by the way, with how things are currently planned um, in, in the US, where there is one regulation that is supposed to cover stable coins, one regulation that could target um, crypto asset exchanges, for example, in Europe, Mika is really, I, I sometimes refer to it as the one regulation to rule them all because it really covers all types of token offerings, uh, ICOs, IDOs, etc. Covers all types, as Rebecca mentioned, all types of crypto asset services. Um, so exchange, custody, brokerage, advice, etc. And it also covers stablecoin issuers and uh, the operation of a stablecoin business. And on top of that, it also sets market abuse uh, standards for the entire trading space. So it is one very comprehensive package in the EU that will be binding for all 27 EU member states. So I think it's it, it, it's very important to know that it's it's a milestone for, for, for the EU crypto landscape because before Mika, we had a patchwork of different national regimes. Germany had its own licensing regime. France, France had a different one. And now with Mika coming into force, uh, it will be basically finally formally adopted in, in April by the EU Parliament, and then it will enter into application after an implementation phase. There will be only that one harmonized binding rulebook. Yes, although two important exclusions from Mika, just for everybody. DeFi, or fully decentralized systems, has been excluded from Mika. Um, DG FISMA, which is the main financial regulator, in the EU is doing a study uh, and has been doing a study and engaging with industry in the DeFi space um, for quite a long time to be able to think about how to even come up with comprehensive regulation from DeFi. And then NFTs are also carved out of Mika, although they say fractionalized NFTs or this idea of like a series of NFTs. So if they sort of become fungible and not that they're non-fungible anymore, those are not carved out, but otherwise DeFi and NFTs are carved out and hopefully we'll get into this concept of stable coins and the idea that algo stable coins are not carved out of Mika. Ooh, okay. Yeah, that that we want to earmark that. That sounds like a, a, a flag we want to mark. But let, let me just make sure I've got some of the facts straight. So um, this thing is, is kind of done. Mika is, is already done. And you, you said it goes forward. Um, it's going to be, is it passed in, in parliament in April and then it gets implemented? Like, are there any other approvals that need to happen? Are there any other... Uh, potentials for this thing to get derailed or is this as good as done and what's the timeline for this yeah so essentially the content is done mika has been approved by all the relevant um, committees in the eu parliament and the council of the european union happy to dig deeper into you know how eu legislation um, works if you want to that's very different from how us legislation works and what's now missing is just a formal adoption vote from you know, the plenary session of the EU Parliament and then also from the ministers in the Council of the European Union. But as mentioned, it's only a formal vote. The content is already being translated into all the different official EU languages. The content is a done deal. And with regards to the timeline, um, so as mentioned, that those votes, those final formal votes are expected for April. The text will then be officially published 20 days after that vote in, in what is called the official journal of the European Union. And it officially basically becomes law, but there are 
transitional implementation periods for service providers to implement those rules. And those, there is a 12 months, so a one year implementation period for stablecoin issuers like Circle. And there is an 18 month implementation period for all kinds of uh, service providers like exchange exchanges and custodians. So basically 2024, spring, summer, it will apply to stable coins and uh, autumn towards the end of 2024, it will apply to every every other sort of, uh, basically company in, in the crypto space. So I just want bankless listeners to to hear that. that that's why we're, we're having this, this episode on Mika is this thing's done. And we really need to understand it. And I think understanding this context will, will help us understand maybe the rest of the, the, the world's uh, regulatory posture, maybe even including the US, but this thing is done. It's moving towards the implementation phase and we have hard dates, 2024, uh, of when this thing is going to, to kick in. For asking about the uh, perspective of uh, the United States, um, well, I guess congrats for to the EU for getting something done. Um, Rebecca, I'll throw this one to you. Should we, as a United States citizen, should we feel jealous about MICA? Uh, how do we? What's our sentiment check over like how good we feel about Mike, uh, MICA as a whole? Um, Mika, and, David. Excuse me, Mika. Mika. <laughs> excuse me. I'm still I'm still learning here. Um, do do we enjoy the things that it has? Um, maybe it, there are some wins, some losses, but at least the clarity is nice. Like, what's the sentiment? What's the gut check about the value of Mika here? I think with all regulation, there are some wins and some losses, but I do think that, and we can get into some of those, right? The algo stablecoin thing, I think mm -hmm. is a little more complex than, you know, having carved out DeFi and NFTs. Um, I do think it's a great example to look towards, especially mm -hmm. for what Patty said, how comprehensive it is. Now it is about 380 pages and they were going to vote on it in February, but because it takes so long to translate such a comprehensive bill into 27 different languages, it's it, they postponed it to April. But it does really cover things and it covers all the things we talk about in regulation, like, you know, how to custody something, um, notice and disclosure rules, AML, um, even things like sustainability and talking about environmental impact, which we think a lot about, safekeeping, um, the amount of reserves you need to have. So all the different types of regulatory issues that we talk about in the U.S. are covered by MECA. Um, and it has been, I think, even an example for other non-EU countries overseas um, in this idea of let's regulate centralized actors first and then continue to learn about these more novel applications, um, somewhat more crypto native and decentralized, and then figure out how to build that out later. Because the UK, I'll just say it briefly because I know it's not a UK based show, but on February 1st, the UK's um, Treasury Department put out a large consultation on crypto assets, and it very much mirrors what Mika look like what Mika looks like. It's shorter um, and it does let industry weigh in. So if you're interested, go look at it and weigh in on it. Um, but it looks a lot like it. And I think for whatever issues we may bring up or other people may have with Mika, it at least sets a good precedent. Okay, so it's comprehensive. They've covered everything. They've exclu excluded some things that are so somewhat uncertain, which was heartening to me to hear you say earlier, they're excluding NFTs explicitly, ex excluding DeFi. Thank God, because I'm not convinced any legislator on the on the planet actually, I don't even think the crypto industry knows enough to, to have proposed any sort of rule set for these things. So it's, it's too early to do that. But um, I think what, uh, what we'd love to know from our panelists today is like, overall, um, you said there are trade-offs, right? Nothing's perfect, of course, but like overall, is this a win or a loss? Like if we were to give uh, from the crypto natives here or the crypto community a, a letter grade to this, uh, is this a B, is this a C? Like, what are we talking here? And maybe it varies depending on kind of the categories. Like maybe it's a, a B in, in stable coins, but uh, maybe for like, well, Maybe it's not for algo stable coins. Maybe that's like a D minus or something. I'm curious, first, your take on this. Uh, give us some letter grades for, for these categories to, to help us know where, where the wins and losses are, Rebecca. Uh, me to start on the letter grades? Um, really putting me to the fire here, you guys. Um, <laughs> I'd say like an overall grade is probably a B, B minus, just because, you know, I think algos are complicated. I'm thinking about fractionalized NFTs are somewhat complicated. Um, but, you know, like definitely A for effort. Um, for <laughs> <laughs> um, and I will say, 
uh, you know, a lot of the European regulators have spent a long time learning about some of the more complex and crypto native aspects here, like DeFi and the like. Um, so you have to give them credit for that, even though you don't see it necessarily in Nika. Um, I would say I'm actually fascinated to hear what Patty has to say about the um, asset classifications, because they do have a different set of classifications for different types of crypto assets. Um, and they're not as comprehensive as um, other types of um, uh, taxonomies and uh, that I've seen. So I'd give that maybe like a B minus as well, um, just because I think it's a little complex and it doesn't break out all the different types of crypto assets that we've seen. As far as regulations for CASPs, um, I think definitely a B, B plus. Um, Stablecoin issuers, I'm going to leave the, the grade to Patty because I know the reserve requirements are very onerous. So I think that's a little complex. And then the last piece I'd say is on token issuances where you don't have an identified issuer. That's pretty special. And I'd say I'd give it a BB plus because they do put listings and white papers about those tokens on the exchanges, which I think is sort of the right shift um, of where the responsibility sits. Rebecca, you were totally ready to give letter grades. That was amazing. Uh, thank you. And, and just so we get the the benchmark for um, the teacher assigning these grades right now, um, Rebecca. So, uh, do you remember the thing going on in the U.S. this this proposed legislation called the Digital Commodities Consumer Protection Act? If that doesn't ring a bell. It for for bankless listeners, it's the thing that SBF was real excited about uh, a few months ago. That that got pretty far. Um, what would be your score for something like that? Because I know my letter grade for that. Uh, but what what is yours? Just so we have a benchmark of what you you know consider good or, or bad. I think it's too hard to get. I'm going to give the lawyer answer. I actually think it's too hard to give a letter grade to the DCCPA because it was never in a final mm -hmm. form. So it's pretty unfair to... I'll give them definitely, there was a lot of effort that went into that for sure. But I think because we didn't see a final draft of it, too hard for me to letter grade it. Well, my uh, the post that I read from Sam Bankman fried talking about how DeFi front ends would all need to be registered at kind of a state level. Um, to me, that was pure nightmare fuel. And that is like, I don't know if there's a grade lower than F uh, in, in, any, um, in any nation, but um, that, that's what I would certainly assign that. But, but the point is, and I agree, like conceptually, I agree on that. I think, you know, all regulation should really be activities based. That's how it works today. That's how Mika is built out and all of these other types of things is really activities based. Um, but at the same time, like it was just sort of, it wasn't final. So to take right. away anything there is really tough. Patrick, I want to zero in on stable coins here. Uh, and of course, since you uh, are over at Circle, I'm, I'm wondering if you could provide uh, Circle's opinion as to how good or not good Micah, Mika's approach to stablecoin regulation is. Uh, can you give us your takes about how Mika relates, Mika relates to stablecoins? Sure, happy to. I'm, I'm, I'm not familiar enough with American grading levels, <laughs> so I try to avoid that. But um, <laughs> overall, I think what is positive, and, and that is true also for the stablecoin part, that Mika sets a clear regulatory path, right, for those kind of issuers and for those kind of businesses. Um, so essentially, I think that's the first po positive thing I want to mention. And the second one is that it's one harmonized regulation. So for stablecoin issuers, if they issue a stablecoin, for example, out of France or out of Germany, they will be able to basically passport those services into all the 27 EU uh, countries. So that's, that's a major milestone for crypto asset businesses in the EU. And if you dig a little bit deeper into the requirements, I think there's a lot, a lot that we essentially agree with within Mika. So, you know, generally Mika allows also non-banks to issue stable coins. Also so-called e-money institutions are allowed to do that. That I think is a prerequisite for, you know, fostering innovation and competition in that space. It also sets important consumer protection standards through those white paper and information disclosure requirements. It sets high bars with regards to the management of the reserve, um, the backing, etc. I think we we agree with all of that, and it sets very high standards with regard to you know how the, how the business is is conducted and, and governed, and I think that's that's all stuff we principles of of you know sensible stablecoin policy that we deeply agree with. There are single requirements that, um, in 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 our opinion and in the opinion of, of of many others, could counterbalance and counteract those benefits, and that could stifle stablecoin innovation. In, in, in the EU. And I think we're all aware of, for example, those issuance limits based on, for example, 
a transaction amount and transaction volume of non-euro stable coins in the European Union. It's important to note here that the exact scope of that provision is not yet clear. Mm. Um, EU supervisors, so the European Banking Authority, which is going to supervise those big stablecoin issuers, it has still to publish and issue regulatory standards what kind of transactions will actually fall into the scope of that restriction. And we know from many policymakers that publicly stated um, that you know, most of the investment, trading, transactions, et cetera, should fall out of that scope. The scope should be very, very narrow in, in nature and should only cover, for example, real world payments when I pay a merchant with a stable coin. So I think the impact, the, negative, the potential negative impact of that requirement depends largely on how that um, requirement is standardized. And then there is a few other you know, critical pieces where, in our opinion, Mika's success really comes down to the technical specifications of the supervisor. One other example, Mika, Mika um, requires very onerous prudential capital buffer requirements for stablecoin businesses. And in our opinion, as you know, a payment stablecoin issuer that is entirely backed by cash and cash equivalents, so only short-term treasury bonds, those additional capital buffers are just not proportionate to the non-existing credit risk that we face and to the minimal market risk. So we think there needs to be more flexibility with regards to capital buffers. And, and basically those businesses like ours that have essentially not, no credit risk and very minimal market risk should face no capital buffers or very limited capital buffers compared to, for example, a business that holds corporate bonds in the treasury and in the reserve. And that, I think he, he, here again, the supervisor still has to give us the exact technical guidelines of what it actually means. What, what is a high quality liquid asset? Um, what does the capital buffer refer to? So hopefully there's still room for improvement on, on those fronts. And, and is that something, Patrick, because I don't understand this process, is that something that you think could be improved on the kind of the, the way it's implemented, right? Or is the capital uh, capital buffer requirements for stablecoin issues issuers already kind of set in the legislation and, and you're just hoping for an amendment at some point in time that could be a very long process? It, it depends on the exact requirement, but but on most requirements, including the reserve management and the capital buffers, there will be technical standards and guidelines to be published and issued by the supervisors. So that's actually the caveat. I know we already said, you know, Mika is set in stone. Mika was already approved, but Mika sets the political requirements when it comes to the technical implementation of those requirements. Those have to be specified by the supervisors and there's still room for you know, interpretation and for improvement on, on, on many of those points. Well, it, yeah. it's, sorry, go ahead, Rebecca. No, and just about like a quick gloss on Patty's point. There's also EBA and ESMA who are, you know, two other EU type regulatory bodies. And in addition to the country specific or member state specific regulations for implementation, they're going to put out a set of sort of like regs that you will have that give a gloss over um, what uh, Mika sets out in terms of some of the more nuanced requirements as well. Okay. And so, and it sounds like really the stance here is that there's perhaps some frustration from Circle or other stable coin providers that the capital requirements are more onerous than what they should be. But perhaps to give them the benefit of the doubt, like we can start by over uh, asking. And as the EU and other agencies become more comfortable with crypto, they can start to pull back those requirements. That seems like a reasonable place to start. Is that fair? Yeah, definitely. I think it's, it's I mean, it, it's so great to have, you know, a clear regulatory path mm -hmm. to just to comply with. And there is still, I mean, as mentioned, there's so, so much room for improvement still. Mika will also be revised. Then in one and a half years from now, there will be a first report, a review of Mika saying, you know, this works well, this works less well. What should we change? What could be added? Or, and so I think Mika is obviously a first, it is probably the first comprehensive regulatory framework for crypto assets in the world published by a major global jurisdiction. Um, and it's, you, you, you don't get always everything right at, at, at the first draft, right? So there, there is room for improvement for sure. 
Yeah. Well, again, just stark difference to what we're used to inside the United States. The fact that there's paths forward. Again, I'm I'm very very jealous. If there's one aspect uh, that we that you uh, talked about that I want to go back to, uh, uh, Patrick, um, uh, and I want to know how actually codified this is. The notes that I have here is that uh, Mike uh, Micah limits the daily average number of transactions and trading volume of stable coins to one million dollars and 200 million in euro i think these are the notes that i have and so there's restrictions on non-euro denominated stable coins inside of the eu as a result of of mika uh is this just the eu trying to protect its own uh own denomination which i mean makes sense from a nation state perspective is that really what's going on here yeah that actually that provision was added last minute hmm. into the legislative process by you know, some member countries that were concerned um, for monetary sovereignty reasons, so they added that provision. Um, we essentially believe that there were other means within Mika and within other financial regulations that, you know, could have, you know, pro pro protected um, monetary sovereignty and, and financial stability on that front. And as mentioned earlier, I think it, it, it really comes down, if you look at the specific wording of that provision, it refers to transactions per day that are associated with uses as means of exchange. And essentially, you know, the impact of that requirement comes down to what will the supervisor say? What is a transaction that is associated with uses as means of exchange? If it is very narrow in scope, I think, you, you, you know, there, there's, there are ways for, for stablecoin issuers to, um, to cope with that. But, but overall, yeah, we, we believe it is, you know, it, it, uh, the threat alone of having that issuance cap could obviously stifle stablecoin innovation. It could prevent um, some issuers to seek regulation in the first place, which is obviously not in, 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 in Mika's interest. And, and apart from that, it is also not technology neutral because we have traditional financial rates, right? So we have a lot of credit payments, for example, already happening in the EU. And there is no issuance cap or transaction cap for non-euro payments with those traditional means of payment, right? So why singling out that, um, that new technology? Um, so yeah, overall, we are optimistic that in the so-called level two supervisory guidelines and specifications, we can, you know, somehow make sure the scope is as narrow as possible. Um, but yeah, overall, there's, you know, a, a lot of the media articles from crypto media, et cetera, have also s somehow misinterpreted the, the scope of that provision. Just really quick, Patrick, you keep using this term supervisor. It's up to the supervisor, supervisor implementation. What is the supervisor again? The supervisor in, in Europe for those large stable coins, it will be the EBA, the European Banking Authority. And it will be basically the financial authority that will have to make you know, sure that those requirements are basically followed by those companies. Oh, it's, I see. So a supervisor is some sort of regulatory authority institution inside exactly. of the EU. So like maybe an equivalent of like FinCEN or something. Is a exactly. The In the US, it would be the SEC, the CFTC, et cetera. Ah, so there is a Gary Gensler of uh, the EU somewhere over there. No, huh? it doesn't. It really doesn't work the same. Oh, okay. Wait, Patty, I had a question for you. Do you think that the last minute edition of that was meant to protect the digital euro? Because that's how I thought. That's why I thought it was put in there from a long term perspective. I, I don't know about that, to be honest. I, 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 I'm, I'm pretty sure the main concern was, you know, monetary sovereignty. But I'm not sure in which way it could be linked to the digital euro. I'm, I, I don't know. Hmm. We, I mean, you're right. The, we do see the monetary sovereignty point really pulled through on Mika. So for something like asset reference tokens, which uh, refer to certain types of other currencies, um, uh, fiat currencies, um, the central there's a provision that says the central banks can actually pull or cancel those types of asset reference tokens if they think it threatens monetary sovereignty. Um, so the central banks do still have a lot of power under Mika, notwithstanding how strong the um, regulation may be in terms of allowing different types of assets and giving a path forward. Well, and I think the the fear here is, uh, you know, somewhere around ninety seven point or ninety nine point seven percent of stable coins in circulation are denominated in U.S. dollars, and and zero point three percent are denominated in euros. And so the fear was, uh, you know, Mika comes along, 
you know, uh, legalizes, um, they're called e-money tokens, but basically fiat-backed stable coins in, in the EU, um, you know, right now that's, that's US dollar stable coins, right? And so if sort of the Web3 economy becomes, you know, denominated in US dollar backed uh, stable coins, there's really no room or need for a euro backed stable coin. And I think that was the fear um, that, that prompted that last minute change. I'm glad they're scared, honestly. <laughs> I, like, I want jurisdictions to compete um, against one another for the best crypto regulation legislation. I hope that's the outcome. I know. I know. We said the the joke that EU's best export is their regulation, but honestly, like if this, it sounds like if this regulation was actually exported to the United States, that would just be really, really good. There's. I know. There's one area of sub uh, subject matter that I want to cover. Uh, that's the issue of self-hosted wallets and really what is the stance of of Mika and how self-custody works. Uh, and so, Seth, I'm going to bring you into that conversation because uh, obviously this is very, very related to Ledger, uh, the producer of a bunch of self-hosted wallets. Uh, so all of that conversation and more is coming as soon as we can talk to some of these fantastic sponsors that make the show possible. Uniswap is the largest on-chain marketplace for self-custody digital assets. Uniswap is, of course, a decentralized exchange, but you know this because you've been listening to Bankless. But did you know that the Uniswap web app has a shiny new fiat on-ramp. Now you can go directly from fiat in your bank to tokens in DeFi inside of Uniswap. Not only that, but Polygon, Arbitrum, and Optimism Layer 2s are supported right out of the gate. But that's just DeFi. Uniswap is also an NFT aggregator, letting you find more listings for the best prices across the NFT world. With Uniswap, you can sweep floors on multiple NFTs, and Uniswap's universal router will optimize your gas fees for you. Uniswap is making it as easy as possible to go from bank account to bankless assets across Ethereum. And we couldn't be more thankful for having them as a sponsor. So go to app.uniswap.org today to buy, sell, or swap tokens and NFTs. Arbitrum One is pioneering the world of secure Ethereum scalability and is continuing to accelerate the Web3 landscape. Hundreds of projects have already deployed on Arbitrum One, producing flourishing DeFi and NFT ecosystems. With the recent addition of Arbitrum Nova, gaming and social dApps like Reddit are also now calling Arbitrum home. Both Arbitrum One and Nova leverage the security and decentralization of Ethereum and provide a builder experience that's intuitive, familiar, and fully EVM compatible. On Arbitrum, both builders and users will experience faster transaction speeds with significantly lower gas fees. With Arbitrum's recent migration to Arbitrum Nitro, it's also now 10 times faster than before. Visit Arbitrum.io where you can join the community, dive into the developer docs, bridge your assets, and start building your first dApp. With Arbitrum, experience Web3 development the way it was meant to be. Secure, fast, cheap, and friction-free. And Bankless Nation, we are back with our conversation about the state of EU crypto regulation. Seth, I want to, I want to throw this to you. Um, self-hosted wallets, self-custody, or being able to custody our own assets is a very much a core part of this crypto world. How does MICA or MICA and, or any other crypto EU regulation impact this? What's, what's the state of being able to take custody of your own assets in the European Union? Yeah, so a uh, bit of a trick question. Uh, Mika doesn't actually deal with uh, with self custody. It deals with uh, with institutional custody and 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 cast. Uh, you know how they uh, hold uh, you know customer uh, assets or value uh, on their behalf. Um, but it's actually a companion piece of uh, legislation called the TFR, the Transfer of Funds Regulation, uh, that that touches on self custody. And the TFR is the the EU implementation of the the FATF travel rule. Um, which uh, deals with how uh, financial institutions uh, transmit uh, 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 customer identification um, information along with uh, funds transfers. Um, and uh, so the, the, the transfer of funds regulation is part of a larger package uh, of bills in the EU called uh, the anti-money laundering package that also includes uh, the anti-money laundering regulation Anti-Money Laundering Directive Number Six uh, and the Anti-Money Laundering Authority. So there's a four-piece package, all dealing with really the same topic. Uh, but the TFR was sort of pulled out of that and attached uh, to Mika. And um, the the Transfer Funds Regulation deals with self-custody um, really sort of along a, a spectrum of different scenarios. 
there's really sort of four four scenarios that it envisions. Um, the first is uh, sort of a CASP to CASP transfer. Um, so financial institution to financial institution, full travel rules, uh, full travel rule applies. Um, you know, confirmation from uh, institution A must travel along with uh, the funds to institution B. That's more or less the status quo. Um, so that's that's fairly normal. That wasn't very controversial. At the other end of the spectrum is a pure peer-to-peer -peer transaction. Um, and uh, the TFR does not apply in that context at all, which is also good news. Uh, what the, the interesting part was actually what happened in the middle, these sort of two middle scenarios. Um, and I'll explain those, but to understand um, how we got to those outcomes, uh, you really sort of have to understand the politics uh, of, of how we got to those outcomes. So uh, the two scenarios are uh, a CASP transfer to the CASP's own customer is one scenario. The other is a CASP transfer to uh, any other self-hosted wallet not belonging to a, its customer or Sorry. Sorry, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we got you. Okay. Um, or a transfer to um, a non-EU CASP. And um, so previously, uh, uh, some of the left-leaning parties within the EU Parliament, uh, the, the S&Ds, the Socialists and Democrats, the Greens, um, had tabled a number of um, fairly hostile amendments, um, including one... Uh, that would just out, outright ban self-custody in the EU. And they didn't have the votes to do that. And so uh, they sort of moved to a compromise position, which became known as the, the Swiss rule. Um, so prior to the EU, uh, the Swiss had adopted the most uh, s strict uh, implementation of the travel rule uh, anywhere in the world. And it basically said that a CASP can only deal with a self-hosted wallet of its own customer, that it has verified that its customer owns and controls that wallet. And so Parliament started uh, pushing for uh, the Swiss implementation of the travel rule. Um, uh, of course, there's also the EU Council, which is the other co-legislator in the in the EU system. And the Council is a, the representation of, of the governments of each of the 27 member states. And Germany is very influential in the Council. And so the Council took the position uh, of that became known as the German rule, which is more of a principles-based, risk-based approach it's less prescriptive about you must do this in this situation, um, and you know more about you know if if a cast uh, you know sees a red flag or has reason to know of of suspicious activity, it then has an obligation to dig deeper and conduct further diligence. Um, so you know it's more of a, a rules based approach in Parliament and a principles based approach in, in the Council. Now there was a third party at play here, and that was the French presidency that was uh, leading the Council at the time, and. Um, their incentive was to to strike a deal. They wanted to close the file and sort of get credit for 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 finishing the TFR uh, on on their watch. And so they ended up doing what's very common in these sort of political uh, negotiations uh, and sort of splitting the baby. So they created these two scenarios where if a CASP uh, is 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 asked to transfer to uh, its own customer's wallet, the Swiss rule applies. Right, it has to it has to verify that that its customer in fact owns and controls that wallet, uh, which is a, a sort of a relatively high uh, KYC standard. But then, in a situation where the CASP is being asked to transfer to any other third party or a non-EU CASP, then the German rule applies, and the risk and, and it's a risk based risk based approach, which is actually a lower standard. So you get this sort of strange scenario where a CASP dealing with its own customer that it already has a relationship with has a higher KYC standard than dealing with a random third party or even another financial institution. Um, is so, it, uh, you know, so that's sort of the spectrum of the, the the transfer funds regulation and how it applies to self-hosted wallets. Is it coherent or is it a spaghetti mess? Because it kind of sounds like it's a spaghetti mess. I mean, you know, I think where it ended up, uh, you know, doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, and I think it, it it sort of reflects that that sort of ugly sausage making of the political process. Mm -hmm. Um but it's a it's a heck of a lot better than you know the original uh, you know proposed alternative of just outright banning self custody in the EU. Um, thankfully, that didn't happen. Okay, I, I can't. 
I just can't imagine. Like, so um, it sounds like the outcome wasn't bad. You know, maybe maybe the B minus again kind of outcome. It could have been a lot worse. Sounds like the process I, was I, bad. <laughs> I can't imagine um, that anyone would think in the EU that this would be an export, a regulatory export from the EU if they were planning to ban all self custody wallets. Like, how would that allow you to catch the next wave of the internet? Um, it, it seems like from uh, what you guys are describing, the process is not just about, hey, we want, it, we want to capture the next phase of the internet and support innovation. It is sort of the similar effect of what we see in, in the US um, process, which is like, um, we're worried about giving too much control to this non-state actor crypto thing. Is, is that part of, like, was there some f- kind of fear injected into this process? Like, wh- where, where, where is that spirit? Where, where's that ideology coming from? That's true. That I think uh, uh, globally, there is a fear about losing government power when you don't have state-backed fiat currency um, as a medium of exchange or something that uh, citizens use. So that pervades for sure in at least certain countries in Europe. Um, I also think that the gloss, especially what Seth was talking about with the TFR on the implementation of this FATF guidance, the concerns about illicit finance with crypto are the same everywhere. And so TFR is you know, when you look at Mika by itself, it does, it makes sense that it's very comprehensive, as Patty said, those kinds of things. Yes, it may not be perfect. Um, but when you get to the illicit finance side of things, it does feel very challenging for regulators across the globe, given the decentralized nature, the pseudonymous nature of self-hosted wallets and things like that. So you do have to separate them a bit when you're thinking about at least the export issue. And for sure, all governments uh, and state actors don't love crypto because it does undermine or could undermine government authority. Guys, we are sadly running out of time here and there's so much more that we could have talked about. We could have talked about DeFi and NFTs. Uh, I kind of just want to zoom out and talk about this tweet that uh, Patrick uh, put out not too long ago, which was, uh, I'll read it here. US crypto is innovate, but somehow doesn't manage to regulate. Uh, But EU crypto regulates but somehow doesn't manage to innovate. Patrick, can you talk about the inspiration for this tweet and what you meant by it and uh, what we should learn and glean, uh, glean out of this uh, this tweet here? Yeah, happy to. I think, I mean, as, as Seth and Rebecca have said, I think it's, you know, part of the EU regulatory culture to have that ambition to regulate first, to regulate comprehensively, and to also export that kind of regulatory framework to all over the world. And that is, that is not only true for crypto, but that has been part of, you know, the EU's tech regulations in the past and all the, also other non, non-tech and non-financial regulations that concern whatever, uh, crops or, you know, um, chemicals or, or whatever. And um, the EU has been very successful with that in the past. If you look at, for example, look at what are the privacy policies of U.S. tech companies? Those are primarily formed by EU's GDPR regulation. The same is true for, for example, hate speech policies and 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 and, and for many other domains. So, so the um, U.S. is literally doing like a copy paste of good EU regulation. Not even essentially copy pasting, but there's just a lot of global companies that adopt or end up adopting EU regulations because they want to target the EU market. <laughs> It's actually a phenomenon that has been coined by one um, Columbia professor in New York as the Brussels effect, that basically the EU is somehow ruling the world through regulation. And the TLDR is basically the EU internal market. It's the biggest internal market in the world, 450 million people with a relatively high you know, purchasing power. And so all, companies all over the world want to target those customers in the EU. So they're just and setting it, the standard for the world. Exactly. In order to be able to target those customers, you have to follow EU rules. And since most companies don't want to set up, for example, different for production policies, but they har- harmonize how they how they operate, many companies all over the world end up adopting EU rules. And so, yeah, re- regulation has always been, you know, a, a, a big um, focus of the EU. But on the other hand side, if you look at where innovation happens, if you look at, for example, the the Chainalysis Index of you know the top twenty 
adoption, crypto adoption countries in the world, there's oftentimes not, not a single EU com, uh, country in there. Mm. So we have a problem, and, and Seth mentioned that, we have a problem in Europe with tech innovation and value creation. Um, there's tons of indicators um, that you could look at in, on, in that regard. If you look at you know, VC funding, if you look at um, startup unicorns, it's, it's, it's not a crypto related matter. It's really a tech related matter. Um, so th that's, you know, that's what inspired me to, to tweet that because on the other hand side, you have a lot of prospering US crypto businesses in the US, but evidently you have a hard time passing legislation in Congress, right? But one implication of what you just said, Patrick, is I, I think you're implying if, if the U.S. follows some of these other things like GDPR, then basically MECA regulation will become U.S. regulation like down the road. If, if Europe, once again, is sort of setting the standard for the rest of the world, do you think that this will just leak and you know, find its way into the U.S.? I think it's not a, you know, it, 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 I'm not saying the same will happen with crypto. It's not a foregone conclusion, but I think, you know, the longer the U.S. waits with setting its own regulatory framework, the higher the chances are that those large American crypto companies that also want to target EU customers, when they set up their own policies, their own operations, you know, for example, risk management policies or how they safeguard their assets or how they inform their consumers. They, that they end up adopting those EU rules and they basically end up adopting those globally harmonized rule books. And it's, it's not only me saying that, there's actually also voices in the US that are warning of that risk, I mean, US perceived risk, that if the US continues to struggle to provide that regulatory clarity, that you know, regulatory frameworks like Mika could fill, could fill that gap. It's, I think it's even, if you look at you know, the, the current US um, CFTC commissioner, Caroline, Fam, I think she warned of that in a recent Coindesk article. Um, so nobody knows what happens, but uh, it, there is a possibility. We've only got a few minutes left here. There's so much more that we have not covered. Um, Re Rebecca, if you could just, we'll go one by one. If you just give your, your closing thoughts about um, anything that, that Patrick just said that came to mind or anything left that uh, any stones that we have not uh, overturned that people should be uh, focused on just because we ran out of time here. I do. Yeah. I, I mean, I agree with um, Patty and with what, you know, others have said publicly that there Mika is at least good to look towards um, as a way to set out a framework for one token issuances and two um, with respect to the types of obligations that needs to be on CASPs or CFI, as we call it, you know, a little more colloquially. Um, I think the challenge in the US, so just to put a gloss on it is like, in the EU, they don't have this idea of like, this is the security, this is a commodity, and these are the people who have jurisdictions and there's a jurisdictional fight over it, which is what I think has held the US back a little bit is that we, ha is that we have these really strong classifications for different types of assets in the US and we've had this jurisdictional fight for many years. It's not the same type of thing in Europe. So, but also it took Europe a number of years, right? We said it happened in 2017, 2018, and it just passed at the end of last year. It's a multi-year process and it's still not implemented yet. So I am hopeful um, because there are a number of policymakers, both in the House and the Senate, who are looking to build out strong regulatory regimes um, that look similar to this, or at least you know have these similar types of ideas that really are based on consumer protection and market integrity. And I am hopeful we will achieve that. And I'm at least grateful that Mika is out there as a path forward in the EU. Seth, what other stones have we left unturned that you would advise people go down to investigate if they wanna learn more? Yeah, well, so I think, you know, sort of responding to the the, the innovation versus regulation uh, discussion and, and, and Patty's tweet, uh, you know, I think there, there's a temptation for, you know, for, for particularly European policymakers to sort of look and, and see, you know, oh, look, you know, these big U.S. companies are adopting our, our rules and, and sort of pat themselves on the back, right? But there's a there's a cost uh, to that and, and sort of being the first to regulate and, and regulating comprehensively comes with a cost. And, and you know, I think where that shows up is um, if you look at some statistics, um, you know, uh, if you look at the 20 largest tech companies in the world, tw uh, 12 are American, eight are Chinese, zero are European. And if you zoom out a little bit more, uh, if you go back to like around the year 2000, 
um, not just tech, but uh, but you know the hundred largest companies in the world. I think forty one were European. Uh, today that number is fifteen. At that rate of decline by twenty thirty two, it could be zero. Right. So you know regulation comes at the cost of innovation and and the value creation um, you know that is the reward of innovation. Right. So um, you know I, I think that aspect. Uh, gets overlooked a lot, right? Regulation means everyone has to do the thing the same way. And if everyone is doing the thing the same way, no one's coming up with new and better ways to do it. Um, you know, and so I think that's, you know, as, you know, America may struggle a little bit to sort of find the right approach, but I think um, it, it's actually smart to take uh, take its time um, and, and to not be so quick to short, sort of close all those doors and say, you know, we, the government, have determined what is the optimal way for this industry to to grow and operate and and foreclose, uh, you know, future better uh, possibilities. And you know, I think overall, you know, at the at the top of the show, uh, you know, you ask sort of what the you know overall grade was for uh, for Mika, and and you know, I think where it ended up is you know is about right where Rebecca put it B minus. Um, and you know, I think that's because it was directionally correct in in the end, right? It focused on the centralized aspects of the industry: CASPs, exchanges, centralized stablecoin issuers, uh, token offerings. That made sense. Um, but I, you know, I maybe have you know a bit of uh, a bit of PTSD toward uh, you know the actual legislating process because there were many many attempts and proposals to do much worse things in Mika that we luckily narrowly avoided. Um, so one example uh, was sort of the, the and, and this made a big splash at the time, uh, it was almost a year ago, but there was a proposal uh, to ban proof of work in Mika uh, in the European Parliament. I heard about this. It came four votes short of passing the European Parliament. Wow. And not just, and I'm not just talking about mining here, I'm talking about banning all proof of work based assets, right? Gone, right? Four votes. Uh, and, and there were similarly, there were attempts very, very late in the process, like at the very end of the Trilog negotiations to pull in DeFi, to pull in NFTs, to pull in algorithmic stable coins. Luckily, we dodged those bullets, but the people that wanted to do that still want to do that, right? Before Mika 1 even finished, there are already calls for Mika 2. And I think that's the the sort of the biggest, uh, the biggest risk is that, you know, if, if, the EU just stopped at Mika. I think that would be a pretty good result for the industry, provide certainty, industry could grow. But it's not just Mika, um, right? There, there's level two texts. Um, so the sort of regulatory rules for, for Mika and the TFR are just getting started. And there's this whole constellation around Mika of sort of related regulations. There's uh, DORA, the uh, Digital Operational Resilience Act. There's the DLT pilot regime. There's the whole AML package. Um, there's um, the EU green taxonomy and uh, retail rules that are coming. And each of those will in turn have its own level two texts, right? And so we're talking about thousands and thousands of pages and the cumulative weight of all of that and the cost of complying with the cumulative weight of all that is extraordinary. Which gets back to my original point, which is why there the zero large tech companies in Europe. Um, so, you know, I think, you know, I don't know, I'll stop there. That's my, that's my right. But I, I, we certainly see these points mm -hmm. and, um, yeah, there, there's such an interesting, uh, trade-off. I think right now folks in the, in the U S are looking at what we have seem like, uh, rogue regulators who are using this approach, uh, via, like regulation via enforcement. And we're looking at what, what's going on in the EU and saying, oh, can we have some of that? Like a B minus ain't too bad versus like not even knowing the letter grade, but having a, a professor who's arbitrarily assigning Fs whenever he or she feels like it. And that's the state that we're in right now. Uh, panelists, thank you so much for giving us some time today and for educating us on Mika. Um, we looked forward to having you guys on once again. We appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Risks and disclaimers. Of course, Bankless Nation, none of this has been financial advice. It's not even regulatory advice. Uh, regulation is risky. You could kill the innovation in your country if you're not too careful. All of crypto is risky as well. So is DeFi. You could definitely lose what you put in. But we are headed west. This is the frontier. It's not for everyone, but we're glad you're with us on the Bankless journey. Thanks a lot. <laughs>